All right, it's blue time. Hopefully we can do a little bit better in terms of the rating scale. I have a better idea of where things lie on the rating scale now. So let's just dive right into it with Ashiok's Skulker. Uh, Ashiok's Skulker for me is kind of just bad filler. It has some interesting implications in that it can... Uh, the Unblockable has some extra bonus with Planeswalkers in the format and it does make it scale a little better with counters than it normally would. However, a 5-mana 3-5 body is just not that exciting for me, and frankly, I don't think it's quite playable enough. D+. 4 in a blue for a 3-5 Nightmare at Common, and you can pay 3 in a blue to make it unblockable. This turn. So, this is very clearly aimed at killing Planeswalkers. <laughs> yes, this is... He didn't mention it with like Bond of Discipline or anything like that. I just like bring it up for Skulker and you yeah, have it brought it up for any of the white cards. Like, is your pressure release valve for my Planeswalker got out of control? But it is a fairly uh, steep cost to put in your deck. Five, you know, you don't get to play that many five and six mana spells. So if this is one of them, it's fine. You know, three five that has a, a relevant activated ability is okay. But I don't, I don't know. It's going to be in competition for some rares and some other stuff at five. So I don't expect it to be. You know, amazing or anything. Yeah, I think that uh, Ashiok Skulker looks to me like a C minus. Mm. C minus for Ashiok Skulker. What about uh, Augur of Bullet? Fine. Plus, welcome back, buddy. Uh, <laughs> the the, the so called Trader of Bullets. I like Augur of Bullets, though I think he's going to be worse in the set than he has been in the past. Traditionally, your non creature slots have always been instants and sorceries with very occasional artifacts and enchantments. So Augur of Bolas typically had um, somewhere between 7 to 9 hits in your deck. In this format, you can have a little bit more. You can have up to 11, I think, non-creature spells. But of those 11, I think reasonably instants and sorceries are going to make up at most 7. And more likely in your deck, you're probably going to have something like 5 to 7 instants and sorceries in your deck. Um, you also have to keep in mind that there are vehicles potentially to be played or artifacts potentially to be played in certain circumstances. Overall, I still think Augur of Bolas is just a really nice card. I, I, just because I think he's a little bit worse than normal and even not that much worse than normal, honestly, he's probably just about the same. Um, doesn't mean I don't love him. Um, B minus... C plus depends on the deck. I think C plus for most decks, but if you really start focusing on spells in like a blue red spell deck, then he could get up to uh, B minus pretty easily, or even B. Bolus, because this is one in a blue for a one three uh, Merfolk Wizard at uncommon, and when it enters the battlefield, look at the bottom three cards of your library. Top three. Look at the bottom three cards of your library. Nice try. <laughs> That is not what this card does at all. Oh, he's saying you're going to miss. Ah, I see. That is actually essentially what... C+. Plus. What it does. It lets you look at the top three cards. <laughs> no, it's only what it does in your deck. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Just just for those people who don't actually know what the card that does, so I'll stop brutal. messing around. That is so brutal. This is one in a blue for a 1-3 Merfolk Wizard at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, look at the top three cards of your library. Review, you may reveal an instant or sorcery card from them, put it in your hand, and put the rest on the bottom. Of course, what I'm saying is... I never hit an instant or sorcery, so I just basically get to look at the bottom three cards you, you of my library. Know the but, bottom three. <laughs> but no, th th this this card is a build around. It was a it was a major player in standard last time it was around. Yeah. I mean, this card's uh, always been better in standard. Limited, limited, and, 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 it's always been better in standard than limited. Snapcaster have something to do with that? Yes, it is overrated and limited. Um, you you need a fair amount of of spells in order to make this to make this. See, quite frankly, I think the floor of a 1-3 is better than the floor of a 2-2 in this format. I think, again, we bring up cards like Chandra's Power Helix and Soren's Thirst in particular, which really blow out 2-2s, whereas 1-3s are very reliable protection for your 3-mana Planeswalkers. Um, I'd just rather have a 2-mana 1-3 than a 2-mana 2-2 in this format. So I think I'm already okay with the body. And the upside of when I hit is significant enough that I'm a C-plus guy for sure. A, a, a solid hit. So let's say if you have 10 spells in your deck... Even without a build around. 
Which is and a lot, by the way. Most decks don't have that many. Can have less than that usually. Yeah, if you have ten spells in your deck, you're like sixty percent. But if you have like seven spells in your deck, which is way more reasonable, more reasonable, you're like forty five percent to hit one or more. Yeah, but remember, like it doesn't this really set, matter. Let's say you have fifteen creatures. That leaves you about eight non creature slots. Any planeswalkers are. I think you're going to run less creatures than usual in most decks, excluding decks that are running makeshift battalion and the uh new ember beast i'm gonna take that so let's say you have two planeswalkers that leaves you with six and that means but he is bringing up a wonderful point that your non-creature slots are contested by planeswalkers that you're playing no enchantments no artifacts yeah and, and at six spells you're 40 percent yeah so, it starts to go down pretty quickly so but, people think they're gonna hit all the time but you don't basically i think i would want eight spells in my deck before I play this card because mm -hmm. at eight but you're happy playing pouncing links spells you're I'm going to drop the pouncing links thing we just don't agree on that 50% to hit a spell and two mana one three 50% to draw what is presumably a good card because you're putting good spells in your deck you know it, it, that's not bad no that, that is that is well within reason. And also, so, it should be noted that the red-blue color pair in the set looks to be Spells Matter, uh, as it often yep. is. Uh, in which case, Augur of Bolas is probably uh, quite a good card. Because you, yeah. you, could, you but, could play 10 or 12, you know, when you're prioritizing them. To, to your point from earlier, this card tends to be overrated when we... I've seen this... See, one of the things that Marshall didn't bring up that I'm going to bring up here when he was talking about uh, creature slots and non-creature slots is that we can reasonably go down to 12 to 14, which is what I mentioned in the last video. Because some of our non-creature slots are put in with planeswalkers, and these planeswalkers are going to have, assuming you're playing good planeswalkers, high value in terms of helping you win the game, good board presence, or they could make creatures on their own, or they could have an effect that it helps you on board. So you don't need as many creatures in your deck when some of your non-creature slots are planeswalkers. So you can still have those slots, for instance, in sorceries that you previously had. You just give up creature slots for planeswalkers rather than non-creature slots. Okay. And like the master sets that it gets printed, and you know the last time it got printed in like M whatever, mm -hmm. it. It's the sort of card, because it was so good and constructed, because it's so appealing, people are like, wow, this card's great. It, it's not great. At eight spells, it's playable. And at like 10 to 12 spells, it becomes good. Mm -hmm. But this card is not, uh, you know, a card I'm third picking in an ideal world. Right. So, uh, yeah, I have it at it's like, more like a plus, fifth pick. And in, in, the, in the decks that really want it, it'll jump up to like a C plus. Like it actually. A D plus. Oh, my poor heart. It goes a full grade higher, but at eight spells it's a C. At yeah. ten spells it's yeah. like a C plus. Yeah, that's the question. Tell me how many spells you have, and I'll tell you how good. Are. <sighs> the repulse is in your deck. <laughs> um, next is Aven Eternal, which is two and. Um, we've seen this before in Battle for Zendikar. There was a three mana two one that made a one one Scion. That, that the Scion sacrificed for mana. Um, here we get the Amass one. Okay, so instead of getting a 2-1 flyer for three, we get a 2-2 flyer for three. That is a significant change. Um, much better against things like Pyro Helix, um, or um, Worse Creatures, the 1-3 flyers of the world. So I do like the two toughness, so that's a significant upgrade over that card. And the Amass one compared to the Eldrazi Scion is interesting. The Amass one has synergy with potentially other Amass cards in your deck because that 1 1 token be can become a relevant attacker in the future. And it also has synergy with Proliferate because that 1 1 can proliferate into being 2 2 3 3, etc. Again, Flyers have that extra synergy of putting counters on them scales incredibly well. I love Even Eternal, I think it's one of the best commons of the set. Um, that said, I don't think it's any better than a B. I think it kind of is in that border of B minus to B. I think to make the point, I will give it a B, but I wouldn't blame you for saying B minus here. A blue for a 2 2 flying zombie bird warrior. This is common. And here's the catch 
when it enters the battlefield, a mass one. So I'll read this because we haven't had a mass yet. That's quite a quite a catch. It quite is a drawback. It is drawback, sure. Um, put a plus one plus well, one. That's what here's the catch means. <laughs> sure. All right. So here's the the bonus because that sounds really smooth. Uh, so a mass one. Put a plus one plus one counter on an army you control. If you don't control one, create a zero zero black army. Excuse me, black zombie army creature token first, and then you put the counter on it. So. so Basically, without any other mass, this is just going to be two in a blue for a two-two flying plus a one-one non-flying, In. which is great. Sick. That is, a, man, that is a card I would always play. Windrake is sitting on the bench about. just crying. We now have two yeah, strictly yeah. better Windrakes. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, and then when you start looking at all the other amass cards that that show up in, in blue and you know, some of the other colors as well. Um, you end up seeing like, oh, sometimes I'll build like a three-three or a four-four with this. The first of or even just with really proliferate because you're actually getting a card out of it, mm -hmm. like you know, even, even if it's just a one-one. But still, future ones are still good. Like if you played, you know, uh, even Eternals on turns three and four, you'd be pretty happy. Yeah, you'd have two 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 flyers and a two two on the ground as well. So yeah, I like even Eternal a lot. I think it's going to make a run at being one of the best blue commons in the set. Um, I think it is the best blue common. I'm trying to think if there's anything better. Uh, no. All the blue commons are kind of garbage, and even Eternal is a clear standout. Is it a B minus? Yeah, I like right. I like this at B minus. B minus for even Eternal. All right. Uh, next is Bond of Insight, three and a blue for a sorcery. It's again, I think it's between that B minus and B range. All right, Bond of Insight. <sighs> Shit. This is a card that you definitely need 10 or more spells, and even then it's kind of like, eh, because it doesn't do anything for the first like eight turns of the game. And then the payoff is you eventually get to draw two relevant cards, which is better than draw two, but not as good as draw three necessarily. And that's just not a lot of payoff considering the fact that it's not relevant for so long. I mean, the self mill's kind of relevant with some of the cards in blue-red, but the payoff is just its not that great, and frankly, I don't like the card. Uh, D. Uncommon. It says each player puts the top four cards of their library into their... It gets about the right value if you're actually able to do it correctly, so we'll say D plus for sake of argument. The graveyard. Return up to two instant and or sorcery cards from your graveyard to your hand and then exile Bond of Insight. Well, this is certainly a build around because you did a lot of instants and sorceries yeah. before this becomes appealing. And even then, paying four mana to draw two of them from your graveyard, that's just not a good deal. You, you would need to have a lot of removal before this becomes mm -hmm. uh, really... I mean, it is a good deal. You're drawing two spells for four mana, which I think is correct enticing yeah because it's so hard to get those back and then cast a spell on the same turn uh i view this as a blue red build around card you, not you even great the there matters deck and you probably want either zero or one of them i haven't decided yet and and, and i think no one else is going to want it so you don't you don't have to like third pick it you can probably get it like eight you could 13th pick it whatever yeah. I, I would say that bond of insight is like a build around like c, c plus i think yeah. I think in a deck with like 10 spells, including multiple cheap removal spells, this is the kind of card that... Build around C+, plus. That that's a stretch. I would say build around C at most. I can really hammer home that advantage. D but... Does the mill matter at all? Yes, it does. There's the red-blue uncommon that says a mass X or X is the number of instants and sorceries in your graveyard. Forgive me, I'm going off, the, uh, going off of my head. Um... I'm pretty sure there's another thing that relies on the count of instants and sorceries in your graveyard as well besides this. But I can't remember off the top of my head. But off the top of my head, the red-blue multicolor card, definitely. Well, the mill gives you more options, obviously. Right. That's like it, part of the cool thing is it mills them. You, can, you can cast the speculative bond on one... Jace, I guess. ...spell in your graveyard and hope to mill another one. Okay. But... But, but it mills uh, them, too. Like, does yeah, that matter? Milling, milling them doesn't seem to matter a whole lot. No, I don't think so, either. Maybe there's some, uh, you know, narrow archetype that we don't know about. But build around C-plus for Bond of Insight. Uh, next is Callous Dismissal. This is one in a blue. 
I like this card enough. Um, I don't love it. Obviously, I like Disperse at instant speed because then you could blow people out during combat if they try to do tricks. Um, or you could instant speed, hold something up and, and hold up Disperse. But at the same time, you're getting that extra mass value, and I think that's enough to justify the fact that this is a sorcery rather than an instant. Even though I don't love the card, I like it well enough that I think it deserves a C or a C plus. For a sorcery, it's common. Probably a C. Return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand and a mass one. This card, this card's cool. It's a sorcery which which limits a lot of the. Turns on your proliferate, which is big. Really exciting plays you can make with bounce, but. Think about this as a mana war. Don't look, don't look at it. Don't look. <laughs> yes, absolutely. A 1-1 one, one mana war for one less mana, which is worse than mana war, but certainly still fine. It's a little That's tiny it. baby mana war? Yeah. yeah. like It's a two mana 1-1 one, one that bounces one of their things. That's pretty oh, good, right? Man, I didn't like it until you said that. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all, it's it's a all good about comparison. framing. You know? It's all about uh, like, <laughs> expectations. Boy, you... That's why uh, sensory deprivation is source of plowshares. You framed it right for me. I Now I like Callus Dismissal. Like, if you just saw one in a blue, one one wizard, when it enters the battlefield, return, you know, a non-land permanent to its owner's hand, you would be like, wow, this card's pretty sweet. I would like... It's better than that, because it's a plus one, plus one counter to zero, zero. That a lot. And and I hmm. didn't when I read Cal... Yeah, weird. Uh, now I like it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, you know, we, we've had a three mana and a two mana amass one, and that those are good at kind of, like, floor level, get your army growing, right? You got to start somewhere. Um, the, the, the funny thing is sometimes with a mass, you're going to want to like trade your 1-1 one, one off for their 2-1, then a mass again, rather mm. than amassing while you still had the, the token in play. That's definitely maximum value though, right? Like a creature's yeah. worth so much more than a plus one, plus one counter. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, but it's still, this is like a C or a C minus, right? C. Because the 1-1 one, one that I, you le get left behind... Oh, C or C plus, but two, I two, think like, a C is right. To, yeah, I think it's probably a C minus. Uh, uh, I think that a mass is kind of funny where... It's not even clear to me that having a ton of them is like that much better. Right. Like, like once it gets to three, three, four, four, you're kind of. He's talking about whether or not it's better to be creating a new creature or putting plus one plus one counters on a creature. I think that's the point he's trying to make here. Um, but the thing is, and something that they haven't talked about, it's just baffling to me, is because we've seen two Amass cards and they haven't talked about Proliferate at all. And we're going to see Flux Charger. Hopefully they talk about it with Flux Charger for the, uh, whenever you cast a non-creature non spell, Proliferate or whatever. Um, hopefully they talk about the fact that you can make your army token bigger with Proliferate, because this is a big thing that they're missing. The first time you Amass, you turn on Proliferate, and that's really nice happy and then when you pile more counters on it's like probably whatever yeah i i think that basically a mass works fine in multiples but also works fine by itself yeah all right so c ish range plus or minus depending for callous dismissal yeah i like c minus for callous dismissal uh next is contentious plan it is one and a white makes your mass token bigger grows your planeswalkers um the question is obviously how much is proliferate worth and can we say that proliferate is worth in general about 1.3 mana because that's when you'd really like to play contentious plan so you really would like um, two counters that you're proliferating usually plus one plus one counters but they could also be loyalty counters generally your planeswalkers can translate um, how much mana you're getting for proliferating them pretty well um, but one loyalty counter is always going to be worth at least 0.3 mana, and a plus one plus one counter is always worth one. I think that this is mana efficient. I think it's card efficient. But I'm not sure it's that good because, again, it's an uncreature card and it's just a utility card. And we've been seeing the effects of, I mean, good utility cards kind of falling by the wayside. I'm thinking of like Shimmer of Possibility um, is the big one that comes to mind. It's like a card that seems appropriate but just doesn't get played because it takes a non-creature slot and it's just not worth the slot. So it's difficult for me because part of me really likes this. It's it's board control in certain spots. It's enough value that it's worth two mana. Um, it replaces itself. But at the same time, part of me is like, but is it worth that slot? 
And Mosa me says that, yeah, our first copy I think is worth a slot. Second copy I think is not necessarily. Um, I'm going to go C minus here. For a sorcery at common, it says. One in a blue. Wow, one in a white. One in a blue for a sorcery at common, it says proliferate, draw a card. Yeah, this is a sweet little, you know, card that gets the, the engine going, put some grease on the cogs. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It just it just does the thing. Like if it, you're heavy, if you're heavy proliferate, great. If you're not, this is a kind of low cost way of putting it in your deck, and it's good for spells matter because it replaces itself. And it's good for mass tokens, please. Yeah, I think it's going to actually see more play there. I I, I I wonder what you're proliferating in your blue deck. You're you're, you're a mass counters. That's it. You're there just we go. Counters? Jesus like, Christ. Because this seems like it would be... We need two counters, but reasonably, you're not just going to have a mass. Really good in white. Maybe that's why I did that. Because we've seen different ways to get plus one, plus one counters on your creatures, where contentious plan is, like, not. Yeah. I, think I don't it, know. I, this I seems low this is... impact to me in blue, but probably we'll see play in that, uh, in the blue-red spells deck, like you mentioned. Okay, blue-red spells... Um, Blue white has proliferated and plus and plus one counters. Blue green has proliferated plus and plus one counters. Um, just taking a look at quick eye at black here. Not as great in blue black, but that's okay. I, th I think so. Okay, so I I want to go like D here though. I mean, this is not a card that I think you're going to like prioritize very often. I think it'll be a D plus. I think contentious okay. plan it, it it'll see some play. All right, D D plus for contentious plan. Next is. The card we had for a preview, Crush Descent, three and a blue for an in absolute trash. F. Wait, D minus. Because the high roll on this is technically correct. Okay, let's break this down real fast. So the miscalculation effect of counter target spell unless it's controller pays two is worth about one and a half mana. A miscalculation you have to factor out cycling. Mana leak was worth two mana. So this is definitely worth less than two mana. We're giving a 1.5. Um, it's also an effect that falls off. Mana leak is worth two mana on turn two, but on turn nine, it's worth like effectively zero mana because you know, there's, there's very few spells that it counters anymore. So it's an effect that goes from 1.5 mana down to zero mana. It never gets to zero mana, but it approaches zero mana. On turn four, that's about the only relevant turn where you're going to be able to reliably counter something with unless they pay two. And even then, you're not necessarily going to be able to, because holding up four mana is a fuck lot of mana. Like, your opponent's going to be like, what the hell are they doing? They have four mana untapped, and going to play around something. And Crush Descent is frankly just very readable in that sense. So you lose value because it costs a ton of mana, and counter spells that cost a ton of mana are obvious. You lose value because the effect has started to fall off already on turn four, and you also don't even get to have this like instant speed 2-2 two -two flash, because quite frankly, you're not going to be able to play it as a 2-2 flash when you choose. You have to do it in response to them playing a spell. So none of it works. It's all trash. This card is bad, bad, bad. I'm just going to say F because it deserves an F. Instant, it's common. Uh, counter target spell unless this controller pays 2 and a mass 2. Do we think this card's good? I have a complete joke. They, they shouldn't say this unless they're like blinded by the fact that it's their preview card. I think We didn't this think card it was good when we yeah. talked about it before. We thought it was just okay. Think, uh, yeah, I guess that sure. I don't think it's great. I think it's I think it's a, a card that's playable and they're high if they think it's playable. When it's good it can be really good. Like mm -hmm. four mana counter their four drop on turn four and you get a two two because you were on the play and you get to crush Oh yeah, because I'm just gonna fucking play my four drop into your four open mana. Just sent their four drop. That is awesome. That is great. Yeah. The, the the high end of this is very good. Mm -hmm. The 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 part where your opponent plays around it. That's a LSV knows that this card is bad. He's just trying to fucking justify. A little it. less good. It costs a lot of mana. Yeah, I feel like all the good players are going to know, and of course that includes everybody listening to this podcast, are going to know oh, about sure. Crush Descent and aren't just going to walk into it. Even Literally anybody with a brain can see four open mana. Even early, you know, like it wouldn't be surprising to me if I go to a pre-release, which I guess I won't be doing for this. But anyway, if I was at one, um, you know. If I didn't see the spoilers and my opponent had four open mana in a blue deck, I would assume they had a counter spell. And somebody was just like, yeah, I'm not going to play into that Crush Descent. And it's like, if they're doing that already that early, like the 
the people that you play in a month's time certainly aren't going to be walking into it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that uh, I think that the the better your opponents are, and that people do get better at Magic over time. Like the average Magic player has gotten a lot better. Mm-hmm. The worst cards like Crush Descent get. That said, if you're playing and you have no instance in your hand, are you just not going to play something on turn four? You really run into the problem where if you mm-hmm. do that, then they have a flash card or a- any other instant that gets them value. You're you no, just gave up true. your turn it's four true. for thank you, LSV for basically nothing. Yeah, and of course we talked about it before too. But you can cash crush descent crush descent on a car, on a card that it's you know it's going to resolve anyway. But you just needed the amass. So yeah, but then it's not worth it. F C F. I think C minus for crush descent. Yeah, it's probably C minus. Uh, C minus for Crush Descent. Next is a. This should be the stick in every pack. Radic Visionary. Looks like he's got an. Holy shit, I can't believe. Look, I'm sorry Wizards gave you a bad card to spoil, and I don't know why they gave such a big podcast such a bad card to spoil. But you can't go around claiming that shit is, like, made of gold. Okay, anyway, let's move on. Two mana, one three, and it has this expensive loot effect, which isn't going to be relevant for most of the game, but it is quite good once you get to the late game. And I like my two mana, one threes being good in the late game. So yeah, a lot of stuff I like here. It protects your three mana walkers. It again protects you from two mana two twos, which just makes two mana two twos even worse. Because while they're sitting on a two mana two two, like martyr for the cause or Pouncing Links, which is a 2-1, which is even worse against this guy. Um, you're just sitting there with your Erratic Visionary waiting for late games so that your 2-drop can, instead of just not doing anything, start looting. So that's another real nice aspect um, to help stall out games. Overall, I think there are better 2-drops, but I certainly don't hate this one. I, it does a lot of things that I'm a decent fan of, but I think it's definitely around a C. An idea. Uh, one in a blue for a 1-3 human wizard, a common. You can pay one in a blue and tap it to draw a card, then discard a card. Merfolk like Looter's card. laughing in the corner at this thing. Well, yeah, it's no Merfolk sure. Looter. That card's great. Uh, Merfolk Looter's ridiculous. Two mana, 1-3 that blocks reasonably well. And then Merfolk Looter's like a B-. Game, minus. You can start filtering out your cards. It's a good combo with Crush Descent. You, you, you leave four mana up with an Erratic Visionary and play your... Dude, he keeps trying to justify why he's calling shit gold. Your opponent's just going to think you're going to be looting. Yeah, that is true. That is true. This card seems... I mean, this is a type of card that I really Stop. like if, you, if you're running a lot of instants, and even then, I like it. <laughs> it's very yeah. clunky, but looting is very powerful, and you should have to pay a lot of mana for that. I, I like it. I like this at C. I don't think it's a yeah. C plus, but I think the, the first erratic vision is going to be totally great. Deck. Same. Yeah. Right. And, and by the way, I like it much, much, much better than Augur of Bolas as a... <laughs> yeah. That's close for me. For one and a blue for one three. Uh, next is Eternal Skylord. This card seems insane. I really like Eternal Skylord. I think he's a solid B minus. Um, so you get a Wind Drake and a three three. Frankly, the three three is a bit awkward because you don't really want to attack or block with it ever because the uh, ability is attached to it, and losing the flying on your mass token is pretty big. But just making a giant. The army token have flying is just really big. Um, this could be effectively very easily a 5 mana 4-4 four, four flying haste with a 3-3 three, three because you've already amassed off of your other shit. I mean, it isn't all in that one card, but it's something that you've built up to if you have two amass already done, which I think is fairly reasonable to suggest by turn 5. If you just amass 1 to proliferate, or amass 1 and amass 1, or amass 2 somewhere else, Eternal Skylord is going to make that token a 4-4 flyer, and that's fucking ridiculous because it can attack that turn on turn 5. And that's just a lot of value. Um, frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if it was just a B, but there's always just the awkward component of this body being vulnerable. But in the end, it's still really good. Insanely good to me. Four and a blue for a 3-3 three, three zombie with... I think B-minus is right, but yeah. Wizard. It is uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, a mass two. So, <laughs> like, just at a snapshot there, it's four and a blue for a 3-3 three, three and a 2-2 two, two minimum. And 
which is worse than a 5-5 generally, but not always. Zombie tokens you control have flying. So it's 3-3, three, 2-2 three, two, two flyer for 5 mana, and that's your baseline. <laughs> Yeah, this is one of the cards what? that does make me want to have a lot of a mass in my deck because mm -hmm. this is at its strongest when you have like a zombie token already in play. You play this, give that token plus two plus two, and it has flying can attack right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so totally. Here's Just where ridiculous. you really want to build up the mass where you're like, you know, play two mass cards. I have a three three in play. Turn five, Eternal Skylord attack you with my now five five token. Yeah. And one thing to keep in mind too, I think we're going to be pretty free to go nuts with a mass. Um, I noticed that there aren't any pacifism style cards we do, oh, yes. we, do have, we do have but there's bounce spells the one oblivion ring but that, but that allows exiles. you to keep yeah right growing, that, that's got to be intentional yeah right where you if you pacified or you know cast luminous bonds on, on the amass token right it would kind of negate all their future amass cards and that yeah that is no longer the case okay right. that yeah so i think eternal sky lord is great like Oh, super super fantastic. great yeah and you oh, know, yeah. again i mentioned that as the I completely you have already have a two two a mass uh, army token now it's a four four flyer and it has haste ish right like now it's yeah. flying in the air and it and it's attacking now the turn you cast eternal sky lord i think the game's going to end effectively a lot of the time the turn uh that you play a sky lord because it's going to be like a six six a mass token attacking them in the air that they didn't know yeah uh, also, critically, this really changes the grade. If you have the Liliana Dread Horde General, this gives those tokens flying as well. Oh, so there's other... I don't know that card, but... Uh, That's the Mythic Liliana. <laughs> oh, okay. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, Luis. <laughs> now that you've curved Eternal Skylord into Liliana, you you seem to have found some way to win the game. Uh, but for the most part, you know, really the, the army, the zombie army tokens are the ones you're looking at. All right. Eternal you know, B, yeah, I think, is reasonable. I mean, the flying haste aspect of it is fucking ridiculous. Yeah, I like it a lot. I think it's a B plus. And yeah. the reason why I bumped it is not only its ability to win the game, but also the fact that if you're behind on board, boom, you got five power, five toughness over two creatures. It's good. Yeah, okay. I'm fine with B plus as well. My, my biggest problem with it has always been like this 3-3 three, three body that can't reasonably attack or block because you don't want to risk it on most situations and it can be burned during combat to lose the flying and then you have to deal with that but in the end you still have just a bigger token so it's not always a big deal um i, I think i'm gonna go with b on this one i think i'm gonna go lower rating than them but b plus i think is reasonable actually um I said the flying haste thing out loud, and I reasonably kind of underrated that. It is pretty ridiculous. Going to be tough and for your it, opponent. Eternal Skylord's a solid B plus. Yeah, super good. Um, let's see what's next. Flux Channeler. What, what is? Okay, you know I'll, I'll consent to B plus. I think I, I'm not offended by that. See, I'm still kind of learning this rating scale, if I'm being honest. Um, if you saw my last video, this is only my second video where I'm on the uh, F to A scale. I'm used to the 5.0 scale, and I think it's very easy to say Eternal Skylord is a solid 3.5 and just move on from there, and that would be correct. But like 3.5 can mean anything from like B or B plus um, on their rating scale. It's kind of weird. So I'm still translating it, guys. So just hold, bear with me while I do that. It's a mass token. Oh, Flux Channeler. I like Flux Channeler a lot. It's very similar to Gutter Snipe, right? Like this This is just Gutter Snipe. Um, Gutter Snipe is two to your opponent. Proliferate is probably very similar to two to your opponent on most boards. It's way more board centric than Gutter Snipe, but it's way less aggressive. Um, in the end, I would give it a 3.0 on the 5.0 scale. I'm just going to do the 5.0 scale and then give it a grade while I'm trying to estimate it. And definitely a B minus because it seems like 3.0 is either C plus or B minus, and I would put it on the top end. So B minus. Okay. I, I guess I was hoping for something like a for little example, lighter. You know, like we're going little... to get to Kazmina in a second. Uh, she's the un, one of the uncommon planes. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. she's, she's great. Very good to proliferate. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So maybe I'm maybe I'm expecting too much because the amass token is like I'm like yeah that's fine but eh. but there's 
like, okay, we haven't gone to green, but we've looked at white, and the mass tokens as well on top of planeswalkers, like... And planeswalkers, I'm still not really sure how many we're going to have on the battlefield, so I'm kind of not counting on that to be like a super thing where when I look at the white cards, I think, Oh, I could get counters and, you know, go nuts with those on my creatures, but whatever this thing and has green. a really high upside. Yeah. Flux channel is really strong. When, when you play this on turn three with nothing else in play, your opponent's going to be scared of it and try to kill it. Because if your turn four, AKA play cut or is, snipe. you know, something that caught makes an amass token and then a cantrip or even just anything that makes a mass token, they're going to be very scared that your next turn you're, you're going to play multiple spells. And mm -hmm. this, this is the kind of thing that makes uh, you know, of the contentious plan really strong. Imagine you have an amass token. Shut the fuck up about contentious plan. And contentious plan lets you proliferate, then proliferate off this. Oof. Oh, wait. Uh, oh, sorry. I thought thing. they were talking about the counter spell. Contentious plan with proliferate draw card. Yeah, that's gas. Pretty quickly. So... I think I think Flux Channeler it's a build around because you do need other cards that go with it. Yeah, but it's like you don't a B, need very though, many. Right? Yeah, I think it's a build around B, yeah. and I think I would play around if I B, had two cards that B minus. Work well with it. Okay, and you're gonna on as a baseline. Up, I think with four or five without trying very hard. Right, and there's there are gonna be some cards that we'll see in the red for that spells deck that do actually get you counters. And again, you don't really need to go off. You just need, I just want a little more than the amass yeah. counter but, or token. All right, Flux Channeler build. He's correct that you. you with most proliferate, like the proliferate on contingency plan, your contentious plan, you do want a little bit more than just a plus plus and plus one counter, but you only need a little bit more. Anyway. Yeah, I think it's a build around B, yeah. and I think I would play this if I had two cards that worked well. Okay. And you're going to on average end up, I think, with four or five without trying very hard. Right. And there's, there are going to be some cards that we'll see. Still divination. Still divination. Just an uncommon divination. Okay. Divination. If you control a Jay's Planeswalker, good for you. Let's just call this Divination. Uh, I think C+. Plus. I think this is a good set for Divination. Divination, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But, because, you know, again, Jace is rare in this set. But an uncommon Divination is still Divination, and I, I like that card a lot. Yeah. I mean, jokes aside, I think Divination is just good in most blue decks. I do, too. So, I, I root Especially in a format that's um, a bit yeah. slower. C+. Plus. Yeah, I think Jesus Triumph is, a, is probably C, like a C plus. You see a C plus. There, there, there yeah, I'm matter. getting this set, which there aren't, there is in most sets, and a spell that draws cards is perfect for that. Right, and a, and a reasonably costed one at that. Yeah. Um, all right, you you mentioned uh, Cosmina, enigmatic mentor. What does she do? She's awesome. A solid B. She's three in a blue for a legendary planeswalker, Cosmina. So she protects herself. She protects her ship from removal, including her planeswalkers and your creatures. She loots multiple times. She's wonderful with proliferate. Um, yeah, excellent card. It's uncommon. She has five loyalty. Her static ability that says- Her static ability is quite nice and limited. It's cast that target a creature or planeswalker you control costs two more to cast, which is the best static we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. It just makes all the removal spells cost two more. Yeah, that's a lot. Pretty, yeah. pretty big. Um, and then her minus two is create a two-two blue wizard token, draw a card, then discard a card. Ooh. Also, an awesome minus two. Wow! I get a two-two and I get to loot. So let's think about how much a two-two that loots would be worth. Three mana, because quite frankly, two-two that straight draws a card would be worth four mana. So a two-two that loots, I think, is very reasonably worth three mana. As a two-two is worth two. So yeah, you're getting three mana. Straight off with your first activation, with the second activation, you get another three mana. Um, the ability is worth actually a reasonable amount. So, yeah, Cosmina is wonderful. Undisrupted, she's, you know, two, two, twos, two loots, and leaves behind a pretty useful Planeswalker static. Wow. And she's great. Again, with Proliferate, you, if you Proliferate once, you get a third wizard, though she does die. If you pro Proliferate twice, that wizard sticks around. The fact that you're looting every time you're making a wizard makes you more likely to draw into cards that both protect her and help you Proliferate. Very and powerful. Sometimes you're going to play, like, you play creature on three. Is she, she 3.5 worthy? It depends on your deck, right? There's... She might be B plus. I might have been underrating the wizard tokens a little bit. 
I think B plus might be reasonable. They play a creature, you play Kazmina on four, make a token. They can't even cast the removal spell on their turn four if mm-hmm. they have like a three mana removal spell. Mm-hmm. So oh, Kazmina's I, gonna I be think... really annoying for the opponent. What a sweet yeah, card. Kazmina... Love it. Yeah, it's great. Even have constructed implications. Who knows? Okay, but uh, that's a bit of a stretch. Very good. I would say she's a B. Yeah, she's not. I, don't I think, think B is right. The, yeah. the, the dread lord, the you know the flying dread lord zombie dude, eternal sky lord. But uh, I think she's quite good. Yeah, Kazmina enigmatic mentor gets a B. I, I think I they're pretty um, a little bit closer. Kazmina's yeah. transmutation. This is one of. The- okay, my biggest problem with this card is that there are plus one plus one counters, and frankly. You're not necessarily turning off their creature when you make it a 1-1. Um, because, okay, you're not turning off an army token at all. You're not turning off any creature from just getting a plus one plus one counter, proliferating it being relevant. Um, yeah, so those are two real downsides to this card. And while I would normally consider it to be very good removal in certain formats, in this format, I'm kind of a little more down on it. I still think it's decent. Um, Still think it deserves about a C, um, potentially sideboard worthy of a C plus or a B minus if you have important interactions with this. But um, I think it's going to be overrated as fuck for a while. A blue for an enchantment or a common and enchants a creature and the creature loses all abilities and has base power and toughness of 1-1. One, one. Yeah, that's a cool card. Yeah, these are. this is a, a way... That you can, you know, effectively use as blue removal, right? If they, if they, oh, here's my five five flying dragon. You're like, cool, turn it into a frog. Nice try. Yeah, it uh, is not very good on the amass token. I think it just gives it plus one plus one. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> so, I would recommend not not doing that because amass is already a zero zero. So now it's a one one with a bunch it of keeps counters. The counters. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, against anything else big, it's good. This is the kind of removal you don't really want tons of because they just end up with a bunch of 1-1s in play still. So you're kind of down a portion of a card, whatever you consider a 1-1 to be. Mm-hmm. But it's still going to be effective against their best cards. So I would say having one of these in most of your blue decks, especially your more controlling blue decks, works out nicely. Yeah, it does. And, you know, just thinking of some of the commons that we've seen, you know, uh, if, if your opponent plays a trusted Pegasus... Right, and you're like, well, I could cast Kaz, uh, Kazmina's Transmutation. You're going to be like, yes, I want to do that. <laughs> like, that, like sure. see down this two-two flyer that can jump some other creature a, responsible for huge results based analysis. I don't love that. that. Realistically, won't be able to attack on almost any board. Very good. So, um, this card is not amazing, but it's strong. Um, so I like it at C. I mean, I, I don't. Okay, this is I'll agree. Like C. full-on blue removal, probably not. No, it's close. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, blue gets bounce, gets apparently uh, transmutation. Mm-hmm. I, I would say Kazmina's transmutation is a C. The, the first one Excellent. is a lot better than the second agree. one. Uh, Cura's Dam Breaker. Five. The Wanderer target for blue. I like Cura's Dam Breaker quite a bit, honestly. I think that it's going to be quite solid. Um, obviously, there's a limit to how many six drops you can run, but in terms of six drops, I mean... Reasonably, you only have to proliferate one plus one plus one counter for it to be like kind of worth in terms of um, mana efficiency. And on turn six, it's very easy to say that proliferate could very easily be worth two to four mana. Probably closer to the two, 2.5 ish. But if we're saying that's 2.5 ish mana, then you're getting a five six body for like fucking three and a half mana, which isn't directly translated, but reasonably is just shows you that this card is actually quite good. Um, yeah, I, I like playing one or two, sometimes three copies, but usually one to two copies of this card. Um, I think it's going to be a bit underrated at the start of the draft format. It's somewhere between C and C+. Plus. Um, but I'm going to just say C+, plus because quite frankly... Blue only has two good common creatures, and Dam Breaker is one of them. Uh, Avon Eternal is the other, so it gets a little bit of extra value because of its necessity in the blue decks. Five and a blue. Damn. For a 5-6 Leviathan, Leviathan, it's uh, common, and when it enters the battlefield, you da, 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 proliferate. So good. It's expensive enough that I'm not really going to build my deck as this with this in, as a payoff, but... In the average blue deck, no. if this gets you something, you know, 
most of the time you play it, that that is good enough. Mm-hmm. Six mana for a five six is is a fine stat line. So yeah, this looks like think, a D to me though. Nah, this looks like I I think this is going to end up being like probably like a D plus C minus probably a D plus. Okay, D plus makes it five six. Is- My heart is breaking. I C for sure. I'm happy to play one or two copies of this card. We're going to look at the other blue creatures, of this, or blue common creatures. So, so far in terms of blue common creatures, the only one that we both agree is any good is Aven Eternal. Um, this isn't really a creature, though it technically kind of is, so you can make an argument that's two. So just keep that in mind. We have like one and a half creatures besides Dambreaker. And it being a like, common. Probably like a D plus C minus. Probably a D plus C minus. Okay, D plus makes it. Five, six is big. Proliferate's whatever. Proliferate is not whatever. Ever. Oh, by the way, do you see? You can, Come on, Marshall. You can actually see Kiora. <laughs> she's on, it, oh, she's on see, his yeah. head like, go that way. <laughs> That's kind of sweet. <laughs> Uh, so D plus, don't tell Kiora we said sort of, though, for his dam breaker. Tell Kiora. Uh, next is Lazatep Platine. That's some sweet. Um, trash. Ranger's Gal's better. And. Yeah, just not a fan. The artwork there. Uh, one and a. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, one and a. Yeah. Blue for an instant and uncommon. A mass one. D. So instant speed, a mass one. You and permanents you control gain hexproof until end of turn. This hmm. card's pretty sweet. It it essentially counters a removal spell, leaves either a one one or a plus plus one counter behind. But it's twice as expensive as Ranger's Guile, and you don't get the plus one plus one counter combat trick aspect. Instead, you get protection for your walkers, but that's not really as relevant, I think. Just double the cost on Ranger's Guile is not a fan. Like I'm, I'm not a fan. Mm-hmm. can also stop you from getting burned out or you know mm-hmm. whatever it is they're trying to mm-hmm. target you with yeah I, I, I think that this card you're always gonna play it just because it is just good value and it's gonna lead to some pretty mm-hmm. six mana for sure is dam breaker unplayable double cost Rangers gal you're always gonna play it. no and but you... countering countering a removal spell in doing a ma- yeah. in amassing one yeah. Plus the combat trick potential that adds up to. Yeah, it does. It's like to me, we've just barely cobbled together a Holy card that shit, I'm, like, my eyes I'm not are comfortable rolling saying you're always going to play Lazatep Plating. Thank you, Marshall. I think if you have enough other amassed cards and or okay. creatures, you're, you're going to main deck this. Okay, yeah, and that's that, true. Especially if you have like Spells Matter not or even. Proliferate. And then you'll side it out against someone who has no removal, mm-hmm. and that'll happen some of the time. But I, I'm on the, the edge of main decking this and then siding it out if necessary. Okay, yeah. That that sounds reasonable. Uh, so, but it's I'm not, not. Great. like what is this? A C? It's expensive as shit. I think it's a C. Yeah, I'm gonna go C minus on last step play. I think it's fine. Thank you, Marshall. It's a D plus at most. Not great. Uh, Naga Eternal. Uh, uh, really bad D. Uh, two and a blue for a three two. It's mm. common. N- yeah, Naga lot going on yeah, here. Yeah, <laughs> not, not gonna work here anymore. All right, uh, we'll give that. Nice Minus. No argument here. Yeah. Uh, this is, oh, next one is another Planeswalker uh, at Uncommon. This is Narset Parter of Veils. This is one. Did the math. All right, we're assuming you're playing 13 creatures, 17 lands, and 10 um, non creature cards. Non creature, non land cards. This, including Narset, which may not be fair in terms of the math. So we're saying you have nine non creature cards balanced out with lands and creatures in your deck. So reasonably I'm saying 14 creatures, but so 14 creatures are a 36% chance to miss. Um, 13 creatures, you're closer to uh, 33. I think it's about 34%. I, I don't know exactly, but I know if you have nine targets left in your deck or average targets, I guess, on average, it's pretty close to a third of the time you're going to miss with Narset. And with two activations, it's reasonable to assume you're going to miss once. So this, at best, is going to be a little bit better than Divination because you're going to hit twice um, on its own. And at worst, you're going to simply use it as this kind of like dig spell that only replaces itself. Um, I'm not a fan. 
for the same reason they're not a fan of Augur of Bolas. I'm not a fan of Narset. Um, yeah. In the spells deck, blue red spells, sure, actually, you know, Narset goes up quite a bit. Your miss rate when you start getting up to things like 10 to 12 spell or 10 to 12 non creature cards starts to get fairly reasonable um, to assume that you're going to double replace yourself. And then she just becomes a better version of Bond of Insight at one less mana, which just goes to show you how bad Bond of Insight is. Um, Fine, right? I mean, yeah, that's be comparable good. to Divination, right? Like, it's a little worse than Divination in most decks. It's, it's in that range. Is this better or worse than that? A little worse. I think it's generally worse than Divination. Because you, you might miss. Because you might miss, and sometimes they're, they're going to have a creature in play, and you're not going to get the second card right. like this. Yeah. Um, build around C+. Plus. On its own, C minus to D plus. Yeah, I really want to like this card, and I'm sure in the spells deck where you're kind of more or less guaranteed to hit, or you know have a really high probability of hitting, then it, she probably becomes pretty strong. But let's say that let's say I had six. In the spells deck, she is probably better than divination. Hits in my deck. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I... then you're looking at something like. Almost fifty percent chance to miss. I'm not. Th this is a kind of card that I read and I see, and I'm like, I'm in. I want to play this, but when I really pare it down, I think I'd rather just have six, divination. If you have wonderful analysis here, like really good job, LSVM Marshall. Like I'm not being sarcastic at all. I've thought about it. I've done some calculations, and I've quite frankly, I just agree with you guys. Like, um, I wanted to like Narset, and then I just thought about it more and did some math, and was like, "No, I don't like her." Six hits in your decks, you're like you're like fifty fifty to hit on each. That's one. about right. Yeah. <sighs> Man, I, I just don't know if I can get super stoked on Narset Parter of Veils. I, no, I I think, I think I'd rather think, just have Divination, which isn't saying a ton, you know. I think Narset is a D, and in your heavy spells deck, you'll probably play her, but not be thrilled about it. Sad. I really wanted Narset to be sweet. Narset, part of our veils, gets a D. No escape. Two and a blue for an instant. It's common. Counter. Um, so, you're, so you're playing cancel, but you give up the opportunity to counter instants, sorceries, artifacts, and enchantments to scry one. And you're saying, is that worth it? Is that better than cancel? And frankly, the answer is no. What the fuck are you talking about? Um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of instants and sorceries you would rather counter with cancel um, than no escape does. Like, man, it just it compares very unfavorably to cancel, basically. And sir, sure, when it's good, it's better than cancel, but it's not better enough than cancel like not a fan uh d plus in sealed you can definitely play it because everybody's going to be playing probably two at least two planeswalkers in their decks so main deck in sealed if you want but not a big fan in other formats target creature or planeswalker uh, spell. If that spell is countered this way, exile it instead of put it into its owner's graveyard, and you scry one. Hey, I mean, yeah. creatures and planeswalkers are kind of the name of the game in this set, right? Yeah, this this does a good good job of protecting you from them. Uh, the exile part doesn't matter a whole lot, but the right. uh, scry one sure does. So I like no escape. I think I would probably just put it at C and say I'll play one of them, maybe two, and. I'm going to play zero of them, maybe one, and I'd rather play it in the sideboard. Well, he did a wonderful job at comparing Narset to Divination. Why can't you do a very easy job of comparing No Escape to Cancel? But, uh, right. Scry one sure does. So well, I like No Escape. I think I would probably just put it at C and say I'll play one of them, maybe two, and be okay with that? Yeah, I mean, roughly speaking, it's a cancel. You know, uh, it's countering the thing that you want to counter the majority of the time anyway. So C for no escape. Uh, what about Relentless Advance? This is So Hill Giant is no longer the vanilla test. 
a mass 3 is worth 3, or 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters is worth a little more than 3 in mana because you're starting to gain exponentially a little bit in terms of um, the pressure you're putting on. But it's not worth much more than 3 mana. Um, yeah, it's just not that good. You might play 1 C minus. D plus, somewhere in that range. I think C minus is reasonable. I'm okay playing one sometimes. Three in a blue, it's a sorcery at common, and it says a mass three. So by itself, it's four mana for a three three that's vulnerable to bounce. Mm -hmm. Just not good. But where it gets a little more interesting is if you have an amass theme and you can reliably have a zombie token in play, this gives it plus three, plus three, lets you attack right away with it because it's already been in play. It also gives you a little bit more outs to combo with pro proliferate, and it's nice that in the spells deck, it's a spell that also is a creature. Right, it triggers so. your. That's probably the most relevant thing, but even then, you're playing a bad creature. Spells matter cards. You can get it back with cards that care about spells in your graveyard. Yeah. Also, let's not underestimate that you get the counters on your mass creature now, yeah. meaning. It ha th those counters have haste. I don't know how to really translate it, but you know th well, th that is a big deal, right? I mean, it's the fact that it's a four mana three three when you don't have something in play already, mm -hmm. or when you do, it's an aura that gives plus three plus three. That's a nice flexibility, yeah. right? Because because an aura that gives plus three plus three is bad when you have no targets, but this either it has a target or is a three three. So as a result, this is better than a hill giant and better than a plus three plus three aura a lot of the time. Uh, though I guess it's restricted as to what it can target. Mm -hmm. And it works with Spells Matter and Proliferate. It's a long-winded way of saying it's still a C. This is why the grades are not as important as what you're, what you're saying. Right. But all those things added together make it a little better than any of... I'll still say C-. minus. ...the individual parts that it offers. Right. So Relentless Advance, especially I think you nailed it in the spell stack, is really a nice one because it's a creature flyer for flyer for permanent... You or Rescuer Sphinx. I like this card a lot actually. Um, the stats on its own are pretty reasonable, and the optional clause of bouncing a permanent, considering there's planeswalkers that just minus, there's also uh, creatures with ETB effects that you want to recur, potentially such like Augur of Bolas, which is another reason why Augur I think is better than their rating it, is you can flicker it or bounce it and get other chances at turning it into a draw spell. Um, Overall, I mean, it's just a good card, and if it does come with a plus one plus one counter, you can proliferate that on a flyer, which is already something we've talked about as being incredibly valuable. Uh, format of 4-3 flyer is great, yeah. You control to its owner's hand. If you do, it gets a plus one plus one counter. Oh, um, rating. B minus. So now it's a 4-3 flyer for four that lets you, like, reuse a permanent or something. Four mana, four three is very good. You'd, you'd always play that. This has, I think on balance, is a little worse than a four mana, four three, just because it requires you to return something to get a plus plus one counter. But yeah, like you said, you can re-trigger, enter the battlefield things. If you have something enchanted by like uh, the, whatever her name is, her, tran her transmutation. Kamana's transformation. Uh, Kazmina's transmutation. Uh, Kazmina's transmutation. Kazmina. Kazmina. This can save you from that. And the plus plus one counter, as we have found out, can be proliferated upon. Yeah, for sure. So probably pretty solid for Rescuer Sphinx. The real question is how often do you actually want to return your own stuff? Pretty yeah, often. How often you know, is your that an advantage? Hand, right, pretty because often. there are times when you kind of don't have either a, something to return at all or um, you know, it's, it's too much of a cost for you to do it, in which case you're running a 3-2 a flyer for 4, which is acceptable but not exciting. I'm going to say 70% yeah. of the time so you like want that. to bounce I mean, something. This seems like it has enough upside for me to be interested. I, I would guess that it's going to be a C+. Yeah, uh, but I, it could be up into the B range if it if we we'll, I say B minus. We find like routine targets that we really like. Yeah, I like Rescuer Sphinx at C plus. All right. Uh, next is Sky Theater Strix. This is one. Of uh, no, 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 no. One power flyers are not clocks. They've never been clocks. You would need to put a counter on this before you could consider it, and that means that it's just not good on its own. Why would you consider this over something like Aven Eternal or like the billions of other flyers out there that are just so much better than this? Um, it would need three toughness so it could actually block shit, and then I would be happy. 
Um, quite frankly, if this was a 1-3, I'd actually be pretty happy with it, but the fact that it's a 1-2 is a pretty big deal. Um, it doesn't profitably interact with 2-2 two -two flyers, which is a big deal. It doesn't like if it was a 1-3 and you played a spell and you got to eat their 2-2 two -two flyer, that's really big. Um, it doesn't block 2-2s, two -twos. it doesn't block well at all. Um, it doesn't attack well until you play spells, and even when you play spells it doesn't get a ton of damage in, and when you don't play spells it gets no damage in effectively. Uh, no, no. Um, D. One in a blue for a 1-2 flying... Sure, you can do it multiple times, but that hardly matters. ...bird at common. And whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. So this is a, a Spells Matter aggressive payoff, which tends not to fit as well in the deck because no. those decks aren't generally that aggressive. So sure, this can attack for two some amount of the time, but it's not really what the deck wants. So I'm not I'm not super impressed by Sky Theater Strix. Again, all they had to do was put another toughness on there. I'm not either. I always shy away from these type of cards. I'm 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 it's cool that it has evasion, right? Like yeah. that's pretty cool, but you know, if if what's your big your big payoff is sometimes it attacks for two or maybe three damage. That's that's okay, but like it's not like you can just trigger that endlessly. So yeah, And if you I, have I think instance, it can sometimes block a little better. Yeah, I can but then die. But not really cuz it has two toughness. And most of the time, yeah. I, I just think Sky Theater <laughs> Strix is like a deal. Cards like this are just not good at protecting your Planeswalkers. No, they're Which not. Which is something you do want out of uh, a lot of your, your, your cards these days. Uh, yeah, I like D for Sky Theater Strix. It's also hard to say. Uh, Spellkeeper Weird is next. It's two and a... Oh, look, another card that completely butt fucks. Where is it? There you are. Oh, look. Oh, look, there's Pouncing Links. There's spell heaper weird. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Pouncing links is clearly an excellent magic card. <laughs> um, Spellkeeper weird. You're getting horn turtle stats, which is fine, not great, not terrible. Um, more importantly, you're getting this ability, which is kind of nice. So basically, this is going to hold you off against aggro and then turn itself into a spell later. None of it's that exciting, but none of it's offensive. I mean, C minus, I think, is very reasonable for a card like this. The upside of C at the most, but usually C minus. Guard to your hand. So, you know, just flashing back to Relentless Advance, here's a good application for that. You play a Relentless Advance, and then you can buy it back with your. It does get really good against people who play two ones, though. We'll say that. Spellkeeper weird later and play it again, and it's a creature that affects the board right away. Yeah, but. I think Spellkeeper Weird is going to end up being a solid addition to the spells deck just because three mana one. Spells that could probably be a C. One four blocks nicely in the early game. It's usually not very good in the late game, so that way in the late game you get to cash this in for whatever your best spell is. That's, I think you're going to play a hell of a lot of these. Yeah, that that is. A, and I mean you specifically, oh, by the way. Well, yes, <laughs> I, I certainly will. It's, It'll be a 2.0 on the 5.0 scale. It's a nice combination because it has the early game and the late game all, all, all sewn up neatly. So mm -hmm. the, the only the only part where it's bad is you know exactly on turns five and six. <laughs> turns four through seven, it's kind of bad. <laughs> so when, go ahead. I was saying when you don't need a one four, but you don't quite have a spell or the mana to bring back a spell. Right. I think that's more turns four to seven, not five and six. So play cheaper spells, I guess, is the. Uh... The moral. Um, Cheaper spells like aren't going to get plus back. to me, actually. I, I like it. I like the stats. I like that it lines up, and I like that um, you know there's a deck that's going to allow you to get stuff yeah. back pretty that's frequently. Fun. So I'm, I'm all in for a spell keep weird. Uh, C plus. Whoa, way too high. I mean, it's just a decent defensive body. It's not a good defensive body, as we were talking about. This this plays poorly into Turret Ogre. It plays poorly into Bloom Titan. It plays poorly into um, anything with a number of plus one plus one counters, like flyers. Um, so it doesn't cover your early defense as well as they're saying. Um, and yeah, it's fine as a one of in most decks. I mean, it handles basically every one, two, and three drop very well. But then it kind of like loses it when it gets to four. It only handles the one to three drops that are on the ground, which is not even all of them. So yeah, I'm not a big fan of Spellkeeper Weird. I think C plus is a huge overrating, massively overrated. Um, C minus is 
probably where I would put it, and C in the spells deck. Um, yeah, no way this is a C plus. That's fucking crazy. A C plus. Weird. Uh, stealth mission, two and a blue for... Yeah, this, this card is so weird. Um, two plus one plus one counters is worth two mana. So you only need one more mana worth of shit here. And target that target creature can't be blocked this turn. So again, we're going to take the white trick idea and say two plus one plus one counters is two mana. A combat trick for a turn that says target creature gets two plus or plus two plus two and can't be blocked this turn. Is that worth one mana? Definitely is. I would play that trick in an instant, and that way I'm actually pretty confident in saying that Stealth Mission is a very nice card to play, especially if you're playing an aggressive deck, but even in just most decks in general, as long as you have some proliferate or at least moderately sized creatures. Um, if you imagine doing this on like a Kiora's Dam Breaker and fucking like being like seven, bitch, <laughs> and leaving behind two plus one plus one counters, which is enough to make it worth the massive swing and the cost. Um, overall, I'm a fan. I'm not sure I'd played multiples. I think yeah, I'd probably play two pretty reasonably. I mean, they're also fucking sucker punches Planeswalkers, which is really, really nice too. And multiples can actually win you games, but it can be responded to by removal, which is something you need to consider. Um, but overall, I think you're getting a worth enough, like a package that's worth enough that you're just fine playing Stealth Mission. Um, reasonably, I think C is the right rating for this. You can kind of vary it on the C scale, but I think C is right. Play the next turn if you don't win the game. If you love it, you could say C plus. If you hate it, you could say C minus game on the spot i really don't like cards like this but we have seen a lot of blue proliferate and this is a straight up planeswalker assassination right just oh yeah this is this is definitely a way to kill your the opposing planeswalkers you know you have a 2-2 they have a 2-2 they play their planeswalker you're just like stealth mission kill your planeswalker right and you get the counters left over so it's not like you feel like you got robbed here right yeah. I, I don't know this does seem like it has a home in the set and it's kind of a clever way to come up come up with a way for blue to, to get it a planeswalker yeah I, I think it's cool it i'm assuming it's in the d range though right like this i think is it's not, a d because it's they were just they were doing the fucking like calculations with battlefield promotion they're like yeah it's a solid combat trick it's a solid c despite the fact that the mana just doesn't justify that. like, And then they're just like, oh, let's take a look at Sneak no, Stealth uh, Mission. Something that's actually worth three mana. They're like, oh, it's in the D range. Remember that plus one, plus one counters, really how good they are also depends on what you put them on. Kind of, but at the same time, we've already seen from endless cards, travel preparations, um, the support two card at instant speed, the... Uh, the Quite a few times now we've seen two plus one plus one counters is worth two mana and is definitely worth a card. So no. So D for stealth mission. Uh, next is Tammy. Fucking out of their minds. Neo's Epiphany. This is three and a four C. Um, four C is excellent. The biggest problem you always have with four C is it's expensive, and that's not even a big problem. I love casting four C. Um, B minus for sure. Blue for a sorcery at common, and it says scry four, then draw two cards. I like this card. I mean, so compare this to divination. How much you want to bet that LSV is going to make a joke about four seeing? Nation. This is this is better. Yes, this is four mana. I mean, this is four C, which, which we isn't. have absurd. played with it before. Mm -hmm. and that, no pun. I mean, scry four is absurd, right? So, you know, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier when we were talking about one of the white cards of scry which is early in the game, Scry is not quite as powerful. Like, it, yes, it can help you find your lands and hit your land drops, but you, you're, you know, when, you're bidding, when you're putting spells on the bottom to find lands, you don't feel like you're getting a huge edge. Later mm -hmm. in the game, when the value of lands has gone pretty close to zero, like you have seven lands in play, your eighth land does nothing for you, Scry gets a lot more powerful because yeah. it lets you filter away straight-up dead draws and draw action. 
Right. Chain Man's Epiphany is really good. If you cast one of these, you're going to be significantly far ahead of your card. Is LSP going to say B because he fucking loves these sorts of cards? I think it's B minus. In terms of spell density. Yeah. Or I mean, if you're really at your fifth land, you'll almost guarantee you hit your fifth land as well. Yeah, like one way to look at it is to think, okay, if you cast Divination, on average, you know, you're going to draw something like <clears throat> you're going to, you know, you're about 60 40 to hit a spell on each of those, right? But here, you're like nearly 100% to find two spells. Oh. You know, yeah. so it's it's pushing double, you know, the the efficiency there. So Tamio's Epiphany, yeah, definitely very Once strong. It's at double a late efficient. game cart draw uh, thing on turn four it's not likely to be the thing that you want to be doing no but oh, it's still good but that's a be, solid because of card. the same reason i mentioned before it scales better than late game anyway so yeah exactly th this is the kind of card that makes it so your control decks beat other decks because yep. you know when you when you let's say you drafted a, a deck that has horn turtle and some removal spells and you're like okay i traded off one for one for your first three plays now what why am i going to win the game the answer is tammy's epiphany is going to be the reason you win those games because mm -hmm. It's going to be turn six or seven. Your opponent's going to have drawn a couple lands more than they wanted. You will not. You will have not only drawn two fewer lands, you also have just drawn two cards off this straight up. Yeah, yeah. And so, rebind it with Spellkeeper Weird and such just gets kind of stupid. So th this card is really strong. You know, the the, the fact that the, the Aven, the 2-2 flyer that makes an Eternal or a, mm -hmm. and a Mass is, is really good means Tamiya's Epiphany might not be the actual best common, but it's very far up there and is likely going to be the second best. Okay, so where do you want to go? C plus? Yeah. I mean, this card does I not agree. affect the this second it's best. slow. I, I think it's B minus. Okay. I mean, it is really powerful in the late game, and it's common. So and, you'll be able to pick it you up. You know, like sometimes you'll splash this in your, like, red-green ramp deck. And... There's better cards to splash. Oh, look, I found a better card to splash. Okay, anyway. Mm -hmm. This will just dig you a third of your deck at that point. Right. So, all right. So, B minus for Tamio's Epiphany. Good. We agree. Yeah. And, and, and I can yeah. actually see, you know, even Eternal, as good as it is, there's some decks that would just, I'm going to play removal and have two of these. I don't care about your 2 2 flyers. So, yeah. It's true. Maybe, maybe this is the best coming. I don't know. Could be. No, even Eternal's still better. B. We will find out. Uh, Teferi's Time Twist is next. It's one in a blue for an instant. Reasonably, I think C is the right rating for this, but C plus could be the right rating for it in the right situation. Instant at common. It says exile tar target permanent. You control return it that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. If it enters the battlefield as a creature, it enters with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. So this is a way that you can do a few things. One, you can save your creature from a removal spell. Sure, not worth two mana, but sometimes. Two, you can block and then blink so that you can have an additional sort of chump block type situation. Yeah. Situation. You can reach. Not that valuable. Trigger any enters the battlefield effects, like you mentioned. Quite nice. Mentioned that uh, Aven, you know, you would get another instance of uh, what's it called? Uh, a mass going on as well. So anything with a mass mm -hmm. re triggers again, and it gives you a plus one, plus one counter that can uh, be proliferated upon later. Got the otherworldly journey aspect. You know, probably C+, plus because it uh, contains proliferate. You know, it enables it. You also get to flicker walkers and reset their loyalty counters. There's actually a decent amount going on here with Teferi's Time yeah, Twist. The triple T. Uh, there's also mm -hmm. some weird timing stuff, like, let's say they're at 3 and you have a 2-2 two -two flyer, and you want to play, you know, play this to kill them on your turn. You want to cast this at the end of their second main phase, so then it'll come back during their end step. If you cast this uh, yes. during their end step, it won't come back until your end step. Mm -hmm. So be, be aware of that little timing quirk, because we wouldn't want you to cast this triumphantly and then just realize your, your creature's not, not around to attack with. Yeah, and that is a weird little timing thing. It's, it, it, it triggers at the beginning of the next end step. So if you're past the beginning of that end step, then it's going to be the next one after that. And that's a weird little thing to get your head around, but it does matter because that creature can... Well, sometimes it's gone long enough for you to win the game, right? Yeah. It, it, you know, uh, the, the, the problem is, is, it, it is it, you, you only want to do that in very specific circumstances since it's only blinking your own stuff. Yeah, this is not a card I want to have a lot of in my deck. Probably no. zero. But Probably zero or one, yeah. yeah. I, my, this is a classic card where you and I can sit here and break down situations where it's good and then we don't end up ever playing it. If you have like three or four good... They're not mentioning the fact that you can reset loyalty counters on walkers. I think that's kind of relevant. 
could enter the battlefield effect creatures. This, mm -hmm. you know, gets a little more appealing if you're playing against a deck full of removal. Uh, note, you can blink your planeswalker. So, like, there we go. let's say you, you know, you play, you know, Kazmina, you're like, make a wizard, they attack her, you, Teferi's time twist, she's gone, comes back full loyalty. That, yeah. that, that's not too bad. But at the end of the day, this is not going to be worth a card a lot of the time, so... Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a deep loss, I think. I mean, getting a plus one counter and saving a creature is a pretty good upside. Plus one plus one counter for proliferate is really nice. I don't think it's a D. It plays a lot like that hexproof card. That yes, it does. The mass one. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Oh, it's way better than that one, though. But but again, like the, the question here, is like say you Teferi's time twist and Aven Eternal, which they were talking about. Suddenly you have a three three flyer, a two two, a mass body. Like that plus one plus one counter went on a flyer and retriggered the amass ETB. And what was Lazotep's whatever the fuck gonna do? It got you a one one and maybe countered a removal spell. Like Teferi's time twist is so much better than that because, well, first off, it has proliferate synergy on any creature or any permanent or any creature you choose gets that plus one plus one counter, which is much better than an amass token getting a plus one plus one counter. 99% of the time because you get that extra choice, you get that extra scaling with keywords, um, on top of the synergy with Planeswalkers, I mean, yes, it is comparable to Lazotep's whatever the fuck, but it's so much better than that, that I don't know why they're saying that's worse. I would like isn't what can this card do, right? The question is, are you willing to replace a removal spell or a full-on card draw spell or a, creature. or a creature or whatever with Teferi's Time Twist? And usually the answer is no. Yes, this is the but exact kind of card we would... Let's go find that stupid fucking card. Literally take what they're saying and apply it to this card. They gave this card like a C or some shit. And then they're just like going over to Teferi's Time Twist, which has way more versatile implications as well as a lot more versatility and choice. And they're saying, nope. Place a removal spell or a full on card draw spell or a creature or, a creature or whatever with Teferi's Time Twist. Because next three in a blue. God, that's so hypocritical. Jesus Christ. It's like they'll give pretty medium removal, like a C. Plus. Then we'll get premium removal of C plus, and you're just like, oh, are you even thinking about this? Like, come on. Okay, Thunder Drake. Uh, not a big fan. Four mana, two three flyer is definitely under stats, and so you need to be able to cast two spells, put a counter on it. Casting two spells is reasonably kind of difficult. I mean, kind of looking at turn six with specific decks and specific hands. Oh no. I mean, you can hold on to a two drop for your Thunder Drake. And it does give some value to your two drops in the late game. I'm just not sure that you're like when you're double spelling on a turn, you're already getting a pretty nice advantage. I mean, it's just really nice. Like when you cast two spells, it does really turn on. I'm just I just don't think it's that good. Um the bit the floor is kind of bad. <laughs> And that's kind of a real, real problem. Like, take... Okay, let's, let's compare this to Alabaster Cure. I think that's fairly reasonable. So you're trading off the Flying Vigilance combo for Flying and this ability. And is this ability better than Vigilance? I think it's comparable to Vigilance. I think that Thunder Drake and Alabaster Cure are about the same rating. And on their scale, Alabaster Kirin would be a C. So I think Thunder Drake is a C. For a 2 3 flying elemental Drake at common, and whenever you cast your second spell, and by the way, spell in this case means anything, creature or, or whatever, put a plus one plus one counter on Thunder Drake. Please don't give it a higher rating than Alabaster Kirin. Yeah. Ooh. This is kind of a spells matter card, not because it says spell, because again, that's just any card you cast, but because those decks tend to have more card draw and like cheap spells that can let you trigger this. Uh, you know, I guess it only triggers once per turn because it's exactly second. It's not second and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. But if you can reliably get one counter on this, it's very good. Four mana, three, four flyers, great. Even mm -hmm. if you have to wait a turn. And I think a lot of decks, you know, will be able to trigger this two to three times over the course of the game. Yes. Which makes Thunder Drake a pretty solid finisher. 
I think it does. I think it is too. Also, by the way, I was just going, man, this artwork is sweet. Guess what? Same artist. I forgot about Thunder Drake. This is another common creature that's actually pretty good. So, Cure is Handbreaker. Probably not quite as necessary as I initially thought, but we also like so. Oh, we got a new, uh, you know, new. I think they're hyping the ability up pretty hard here. I hope they don't overhype it. Artist to look out for. Young Hao Han. Mm -hmm. I see you. This is some great stuff. Um, I like this card a lot. I think that this is has uh, some slight build around nature to it where you might skew a few choices in your deck a little this here or there. But not the type where you're like, well, I need to do all these other things. And it's, it's a common two three flyer for four, which is not embarrassing. And the upside's really strong, especially again with the proliferate that, that we saw earlier. Yeah, I, so I like Thunder Drake. I think it's a C plus. Like I, I, really I like think the yeah, upside exactly. Here is great. I like C plus at Thunder Drake. You don't need to do a lot of work. C. It's Alabaster Kieran. If you do a little bit, it's good. If you do more than that, it becomes great. Yeah. Uh, totally lost this back. Fibble tip. No. You're uh, D plus. He's standing on top of what Nicol Bolas's head or something here. Maybe it's a runes. You need a type of effects because then they're just like sure i'll just play it again um makes Which it pretty mediocre workers. overall what's that yeah it does and like, yeah exactly you get to reset the, their loyalty half the time it's like ugh. you can do it to your own stuff but then you're doing the blank in your own draw step which isn't really recommended either. so if they do have a planeswalker and you're in the position where you, you might want to use it a good way to time this is to wait till their turn during their draw step after they've drawn then totally lost their planeswalker because mm -hmm. that way they can't recast it that turn they don't draw it till next turn and they can't use it that turn yeah, good point. So there's some stuff, and these will find their way into your deck sometimes, but Totally Lost isn't something I think you really need to prioritize. And I, I'm actually tempted to give it a D plus. It might be a C minus. I mean, you can D plus. I like Totally Lost at D plus. It just ended up being too expensive to not deal with something permanently. Yeah, yeah. Okay, D plus for Totally okay. Lost. Last blue. We've seen Totally Lost a billion times. I didn't need to go through that. The card is called Wall of Runes. It is blue for an 04 Defender at Common. It's a wall. F. It's shit. And when it enters the battlefield, you scry one. No, thank you. Yeah, it is it's just not a card by itself. Scry one does not make up for that. So no. I like Wall of Runes at F, which I guess is to say I don't like Wall of Runes. Right. We'll, we'll not be playing it. Uh, this is just a classic case of not enough impact. It just doesn't do enough. So that's blue. And uh, that brings us... All right, that's blue. Uh, agreements and disagreements. Agreed on most things. Um, uh, Skulker. Mm -hmm. This is a... Let's see. Ashiok Skulker. I think I gave it a slightly lower rating, but it, with an acceptable bounce for me. Augur of Bolas, I gave a much higher rating. I like the fact that ETB flickering is a thing in blue to help enable Augur of Bolas to be better in these more standard decks. And I like just the 1-3 body compared to 2-2 two -two bodies. Uh, same rating on Avon, excellent. Same rating on Callus, excellent. Um, they didn't like Contentious Plane as much as I did, fair enough. Oh yeah, they were completely just full of the full of shit. I, I don't know why they're like LSV was trying to like put in some restraint in the Crush Descent review, but they gave it a C, which is completely fucking wrong. You should never play Crush Descent. They're just I don't know. I think they're like literally the only reason I can think of was this was their spoiler card, and they want their spoiler card to be good. And like, oh man. Yeah, F. Absolute F. One of the worst cards in the set, by a lot. Radic Visionary, we agreed on. Skylord, they were kind of right about. I think I underrated a little bit. Lux Channeler, we agreed. Triumph, we agreed. Kamena, Kazmina, we agreed. Transmutation, we agreed. Dambreaker, I think, is better than they said. Plating, I think, is so much worse than they said. Bad Ranger Skull was Bad Ranger Skull. Narset, we agreed. That was great to hear. Uh, no Escape, we disagreed. I think it's much worse than Cancel. Relentless Advance, I think, is worse than they said. Hill Giant is still Hill Giant, even though he could be fast stats. I don't think that's enough of a consideration. We've seen 4 mana 3-3 three, three Haste, and it's actually not been that overwhelming or underwhelming. It's just okay uh, these days, even on a red card. Rescuer Sphinx, we agreed. Sky Theater Strix, we agreed. Spellbreaker, we really disagreed. Um, again, really bad against the green decks, really bad against a lot of red decks. Turret Ogre, especially, is just like fucking mauls this card. And just a lot of decks will be able to get through Spellbreaker Weird. 
through flying or through just having big shit. And so this isn't as foolproof of an early game defense as you might think. It depends on how many people watch their videos and for some stupid messed up reason think that the Lynx card is actually okay. Uh, if you think this card is good, then Spellbreaker Weird is going to fucking wreck you. But if you, uh, like me, think this card is good, then Spellbreaker Weird is going to stand awkwardly and be like, uh, okay. Um, stealth Mission we highly disagreed on, which I think is fucking ridiculous that you can... Um, you can say Battlefield Promotion is a C, and then say Stealth Mission, which is way more mana efficient and has way better implications than Battlefield Promotion, is an F or D or whatever the fuck they said. They said it wasn't playable compared to Battlefield Promotion, which they said was a good trick. Like, it's out of your mind. Um, Epiphany, we agreed on. Time Twist, we disagreed on. Um, Basically, we swapped our ratings on Lazotep. Swap, we swapped our ratings on Lazotep plating and um, Teferi's Time Twist. I like Time Twist more. I think it's way better. They like Lazotep's more. They think it's way better. We'll see who's right. Spoiler alert, it's not them. Um, Thunder Drake, we pretty much agreed on. I think C plus is actually fairly reasonable. It could be a C plus. I'm willing to admit to that. I just think that it's fairly similar to Alabaster Kirin. I don't think this ability is that much better than the combo of flying and vigilance that is worth a significantly higher grade than Alabaster Kirin. Totally lost, we agreed. We've been everybody's seen this card a billion times. And Wall of Runes, we agreed. So again, we generally agreed. Um, big disagreements came when I think they kind of fucking like put wool over their eyes and pretended like cards were good when they're actually just really bad. And hopefully they'll be able to look back and be like, okay, guys, like, we kind of messed this one up. So anyway, that's blue. I hope you guys enjoyed. I think it'll get better from here on. I personally, like my impressions are that blue is the worst color in this format. I like every other color more. Um, I thought every other color has way better cards. So I think we're through the worst of it because LSV and I tend to disagree on blue cards the most, and blue was not good this set. So anyway, that's it for this video.